The overall form of a structure is the aspect of its shape that has the greatest effect on the quantity of material that will be required to provide adequate strength, and therefore on the embodied energy and carbon footprint of its fabric. This is because the type of internal force that occurs in a structure is determined by its form in relation to the pattern of load that it carries. Shapes that cause internal forces to be axial are efficient. Shapes that produce bending are inefficient. The differences in efficiency are very large. In the introductory presentation to this series on structural archetypes, it was shown that the structure of the CNIT shell, in which the internal forces are axial, was 128 times more efficient than that of the Villa Savoie, where bending predominates. The fact that structural efficiency is so dependent on overall form has profound consequences for architectural design in the context of the 21st century need to provide buildings that are of low carbon footprint. In particular, it means that the exercising of complete freedom in the matter of form, as Gehry did with the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, may, longer, may no longer be a valid approach to design. This presentation is about the relationship between form and efficiency. Because buildings are about enclosure, which involves horizontal spans, and the loads that occur on buildings are mostly gravitational, which act vertically downwards, the basic scenario of an architectural structure is one that tends to cause bending. As was shown in the presentation Form and Internal Force Type, the presence of bending causes structural inefficiency. It is nevertheless possible to have a horizontally spanning structure in which there is no bending, and to see how this can come about, it is necessary to apply some abstract thinking. Imagine a structure that is made from flexible material, such as string. The only type of internal force that a flexible material can withstand is axial tension. If this is made to carry a load across a horizontal span, a flexible material will take up a shape that allows it to resist through axial tension only. And this shape is called the form active shape. If the load changes, the structure will adjust its geometry so as to maintain the axial internal force only condition, hence the term form active. All flexible materials behave in this way. A toy balloon, for example, is made from flexible material and the load on it is normally simply a pressure load on the interior exerted by the air that keeps it inflated and determines its overall form. If the load is changed, such as will occur if the balloon is picked up, due to the point loads caused by fingers, the material simply adjusts its geometry to create a new form active shape that allows the new load pattern to be resisted by internal forces that are pure axial tension. The same thing can be observed in, for example, a tent, which is made from flexible canvas material. On calm days, this is subjected only to gravitational load and has a characteristic shape. On windy days, the additional pressure loads cause the tent to adopt a different shape so as to maintain the axial internal force condition in the canvas envelope. This is a new form active shape caused by a change in load condition. The concept of form action, the form active shape, is a powerful one, which allows the possible efficiency of a structure to be judged purely from assessment of its overall form. Shown here are three form active shapes caused by different load conditions on a horizontally spanning flexible cable. These are tensile form active structures. The internal forces are pure axial tension. The mirror images of these structures about the horizontal axis are also form active shapes, but in the mirror image structures the internal force is pure axial compression. Note that I am using the term form active here to mean a shape that produces axial internal force only. The compressive versions must be rigid and are therefore not literally active, but they nevertheless produce axial internal forces in response to the particular load shown because they have the appropriate overall form. Shown here are three load conditions. These are the form active shapes for these load conditions, in which there will be only axial internal force. They are the compression versions of a cable subjected to these loads. 
These shapes are the only ones that will produce axial internal forces for the load conditions. There is another unique shape for each load condition which produces only bending type internal forces. These are known as the non-form active shapes for each load pattern. Any other shape will be semi-form active and will carry a combination of axial and bending type internal force. For each load pattern, there is a unique form active shape, a unique non-form active shape. All other shapes will be semi-form active. In the case of architectural structures, the principal load condition is normally a distributed load across a horizontal span. The form active shape for this is a curvilinear arched form. Note that the shape which is form active for the distributed load becomes semi-form active if the load changes, as shown here. Note that the shape which is semi-form active in the context of the distributed load is the form active shape for a point load at mid-span. There is no such thing as a form active shape as such. A shape is only form active in the context of a particular load. This concept of form active, semi-form active, non-form active is extremely useful because it allows the potential efficiency of a structure to be judged purely from an inspection of its overall form. Given that axial is efficient and bending inefficient, structures that are form active will be efficient, those that are non-form active will be inefficient, and semi-form active structures will achieve a moderate level of efficiency depending on how close their shape is to that of the form active shape for the loads concerned. Looking at these buildings that we have seen before in earlier presentations in this series on structural archetypes, the CNIT shell has a form active shape because it is subjected to a distributed load caused mainly by its own weight and is therefore very efficient. The Sydney Opera House is also subjected principally to a distributed load but does not adhere to the form active shape. Neither is it non-form active. It is therefore semi-form active with a geometry that is significantly different from the form active geometry. It carries large amounts of bending and, as was shown in the introductory presentation in this series on structural archetypes, has a much lower efficiency, around 50 times less than the CNIT shell. Considering now Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum and knowing the sort of curve which is form active for distributed loads, it can immediately be seen that this is not a form active structure. It is also not a non-form active structure, but there will nevertheless be a need to resist considerable amounts of bending. The supporting structure is a steel framework which incorporates a substantial amount of material. This is not an efficient form. This is an inefficient, semi-form active form. The Riverside Museum building in Glasgow by Zaha Hadid involved straight horizontal spans with a structure that is therefore non-form active. This too has an inefficient structure that involved the use of considerable quantities of steelwork. In this case, the level of efficiency has been improved by the use of a folded form and internal triangulation, both structural archetypes that will be discussed in the next presentation in this series. But the resulting structure is nevertheless inefficient due to its overall form, which is non-form active. Looking at these two buildings by Rem Kulhas and Zaha Hadid, it can be seen immediately that these are not form active shapes. They are at best semi-form active, although the Hadid building in the lower photograph is almost certainly non-form active. So it may be concluded just by looking at these buildings that the structures involved will contain substantial amounts of material. These buildings will not produce efficient structures. They will not have low carbon foot footprints. This idea, the concept of the form active structure, can be applied to any object. So let's look now at this shell. In this age of a desire for low carbon architecture, which involves efficient structure, structures that occur in nature, in the stems of plants, 
in the bones of birds' wings and in seashells, for example, are often looked to for ideas for efficient designs, an approach that is often termed biomimicry and inspired by such aphorisms as in nature materials are expensive and shape is cheap. The implication is that natural forms are efficient because nature always uses material efficiently. The engaging form of this shelled creature, which has both an intriguing geometry and that looks as though it ought to be efficient, is an example of the types of forms that are quoted in biomimicry circles. Let's see what the form active concept might tell us about this shell. Is the shape of this shell form active, semi form active, or non form active? Because that will obviously affect its efficiency. To answer that question, we have to ask what is the greatest load that this structure, on which the survival of the creature depends, will have to withstand? And the answer to that is probably going to be that it will be a concentrated load due to the actions of a predator, for example a seabird that will try to crush the shell in its beak, or possibly to a wave that might throw the shell against a rock. These will produce concentrated loads, not distributed loads. The forms here are curvilinear, which will only be form active in the context of distributed loads. Concentrated loads produce form active shapes which are polygonal, straight-sided shapes. So the seashell will not be form active in response to the critical loads, the resistance of which are matters of life and death so far as the creature is concerned. So how does nature, in the form of natural selection, deal with this? The answer is by recognising that this will be a semi-form active structure. It will have to be capable of resisting bending, so it will need to have a thick shell to be capable of doing this. It is, in effect, the natural equivalent of the shells of the Sydney Opera House, which are inefficient in the use of material due to their being semi-form active. In the case of the seashell, the thickness of the shell and its structural inefficiency probably nevertheless represents the best compromise that will give the creature the best chance of survival which is the highest priority in evolutionary terms. As an idea for an architectural structure in which the load conditions are quite different and which are not required to cope with the rigours of immersion in a marine environment, the seashell is not a good precedent, especially if saving in material is a high priority, as of course it is if the production of a low carbon architecture is a priority. So this concept the form active concept, is very useful. It makes it possible to assess directly the likely efficiency of a structural form. This has a direct bearing on the carbon footprint of a building, because the form of the structure will have to be more or less the same as that of the building that it supports. The concept of form active shape and its associated load pattern allows the potential efficiency of a structure to be assessed directly from its form. The further that the overall form of a building departs from the form active geometry, the greater will be the amount of bending that is produced and the less efficient will be the structure. In the context of architecture, the principal load is normally a distributed gravitational load on a horizontal span, for which the form active shape is curvilinear. This allows all architectural structures to be sub subdivided into the three basic categories of form active curvilinear forms of arch profile, non-form active, straight horizontal spans, semi-form active, all other shapes, including non-arched curvilinear forms. These are the three primary archetypes of structure which determine broadly how efficient the structure will be. This table shows a selection of structural elements arranged in accordance with this classification. The left-hand column gives structural archetype. Efficiency increases from the top to the bottom of the table. Any structure may be placed somewhere in the table, according to archetype, and its position in the table gives an indication of its likely efficiency. The Villa Savoie, with its non-form active structure, is placed at the top, the least efficient end. The CNIT shell, which is one of the most efficient structures ever built, 
due to its form active structure, comes at the bottom. Fossor's Thamesmead warehouse has a semi-form active portal framework that is moderately efficient because its shape is reasonably close to the form active shape. Gary's Guggenheim Museum is less efficient because, although its form is curvilinear, it is significantly different from the form active shape. The straight horizontal span of the Riverside Museum has basically a non-form active straight horizontal span, albeit corrugated in cross-section. It is nevertheless basically a non-form active structure and therefore an inefficient structure. The yellow framework of the Renault warehouse has the same structural morphology as the Thames Mead warehouse and is semi-form active. The concept of the form active structure therefore provides a quick visual way of assessing the likely efficiency of a structure and therefore its carbon footprint. Of course, it is the case that architects often have to use forms which are not form active because there are many other considerations besides structural efficiency that affect the design of a building. So a question is, can semi-form active or non-form active structures be made efficient? And the answer to that question is yes, because the designer of a structure has control over other aspects of their form, most particularly the shapes of the structural elements in longitudinal profile and cross-section. The effects of these aspects of form on efficiency will be discussed in the next presentation in this series, in which another set of structural archetypes are introduced.